Hey guys, welcome back to the channel, Daughter of Increase. My name is Nate Denise, for those of you who are new to the channel or who just happen to stumble across this video. And I post new videos every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, all about my faith, God, Christ, and expanding the kingdom of God. As the title says above, and from the background, you can tell this is not another reading vlog. And um, this one is actually an unexpected reading vlog because I did not plan to do a reading vlog for this book. Um, but after reading chapter one, I have to. <laughs> so the book I'm talking about is In the Shadow of the King by Melissa Rosenberger. And this is the first book in the Unveiled series. Yes, so that's what the series is called. And um, it is biblical fiction. And this is basically the story of Jesus and his family. And um, it's from the perspective of one of his sisters. Now, they talk about his sister in Mark 6 verse 33 and somewhere in Matthews as well um it'll be on the screen exactly which books and chapters but um, I'm gonna quickly read the back of this so you guys tell you guys my thoughts on the first chapter and then get into some reading so it says Yeshua the son of Ha Elion Hannah knows her brother is odd, but her mother's explanation of angelic visits and ancient prophecies seem inconceivable, especially since Yeshua fails to meet any expectations of greatness. When tragedy devastates the family and Yeshua does nothing more than pray, Hannah's heart shatters. She rejects his advice to trust him, driven by fear, takes radical steps to secure her future. Years later, Hannah grapples with a loveless marriage, and Yeshua's rebellious actions threaten not only her tenuous social status, but possibly her life. Once more, he asks for her trust. But how can a carpenter triumph over Rome when princes and armies have failed before? Can she survive disappointment again? Deftly weaving biblical accounts of Yeshua's family with historic detail, In the Shadow of the King examines our human tendency towards self-reliance when faced with painful loss. For anyone who's qu who has questioned the existence of a caring savior, this story offers hope. So, it just sounds good and... um. I knew it was going to be good just because it takes place from the perspective of one of his sisters um, and you don't really learn much about his sisters. We know that he has brothers. We know that he has married his mom. Um, we also know that his brothers really didn't fully believe in him until after he resurrected and went and ascended. Um, so to get something from the perspective of his sister is actually going to be interesting to read because you don't really read that many books. Um, a lot of the biblical fiction books that I've come across are more so Old Testament and um I'm actually interested in New Testament books that actually are surrounded around Jesus and not um, after the fact of him being, you know, resurrected or dead. Um, I think the only New Testament story that I've read with Jesus actually being around was um, Land of Silence by Tessa Abshaw. And you guys know my thoughts. Just read, go watch that reading vlog. But um, I'm excited to read this one on Jesus as a toddler. Not a toddler, but like as a kid because you don't know much about him as a kid. We know that he was a very humble kid. We know that um, even as a kid and a child, he was around um, the the people in the temple and the synagogues and teaching and listening and learning. So we know that about him, but we don't fully know about him as a kid. So this is going to be interesting. In this book, he starts off as 11 years old into 12. Um, Hannah would be the second child of um, the first child of Mary and Joseph, the second child of Mary. So it would be Jesus, then um, Hannah. And then I'm going to run through that real quick. It's, okay, so it's Jesus, Hannah, James, Joseph, Simon, Jude, and then the other daughter would be the infant. So um, Jesus is 12, Hannah is eight and a half, um, James is seven, Joseph is six, Simon is five, Jude is two, and then the little girl, the baby, is a baby. She's an infant. So um, we have that. They do have the actual Hebrew names of the characters. <laughs> Of the characters of the people from the bible so like joseph is yosef mary is miriam yeshua would be jesus yaakov which is james you Yo which I, I don't i can't pronounce them so i'm gonna say them in the english which is jesus joseph mary james joseph um simon jude and Sol salome salome i think that's how you say that but she does give you a whole like character list and who's who um in here i mean but chapter one, let's talk about it. Oh my God, it wrecked me. It made me cry. It made me emotional, which is why I decided to do a reading vlog. And um, I do apologize if you hear that music. My landlord is downstairs with family and friends or something like that. And they're blasting music. So hopefully you can hear it. But yeah. But anyways, oh, let's talk about chapter one. Chapter one gutted me because um, 
when you think about Jesus, you don't always really think about his siblings. You think about Mary, you think about Joseph, and you don't really think about Joseph. You really more so think about Mary because she gave birth to the Savior and she had to endure so much being a mom concerning him. But um, getting an inside scoop on what his life would have been, could have, you know, possibly been like with siblings at a young age blows my mind. So it starts off with Hannah, okay? And it says that I squirmed and sat as tall as I could, trying to get Ima's attention without success. She stared right past me. I knew who held my mother's interest. Yeshua. Who else? First of all, like, that killed me. It's like, I, I could only just imagine her trying so hard to get her mother's attention. But Mary is so in awe and so concerned about Jesus because she knows the prophecy concerning him. She knows everything concerning him because I believe it was the angel Gabriel that came and told her. Um, so I, I could only imagine you have all these other kids, but you're like in awe of your oldest son, you know, the savior of the world. You're, you're trying to figure out when he's going to come into himself and when he's going to start to work. So she, it, it it's kind of sad because it's just like, you have other kids, pay your kids attention. Okay. Then on the same page, um, we have Hannah talking about her brother. She's like, he, his face wasn't striking. He seemed gangly. Um, his body didn't grow fast enough to appease his limbs. She couldn't find a single feature to merit Ima's endless admiration. Then she says that, you know, the strangers always remark how she's the prettiest girl. Um, and why didn't her mother stare at her? So for me, I put that God uses the seemingly useless and normal over the pretty and bright. And what, what I mean by that is we understand that God uses the foolish to confound the wise. But even in doing that, he can take the ugly to confound the pretty. He can take the small to confound the big, you know. Um, he can take the insignificant to confound those things that are significant, you know. So that just is something that popped in my head and I, I wrote that on the side here. But um, the fact that she's comparing her looks to her brother is just like, girl, oh my God, you must really be upset. All right. Moving on. Then we got this little, ooh, I need to actually mark this because it made me mad. But we have this lady named Rachel who really tried to come for Mary. And I wanted to go jump through the pages and punch on her face. Lord, forgive me. But I really wanted to pop that lady. So her name is Rachel. And she says this. Um, they grow up so fast, don't they? So several women murmured their assent. She says, how old is your eldest, Miriam? Mary, basically. Um, she says, why, Jesus must be almost 11 years old by now. So it says that Ima, which would be Mary. Um, so Mary lowered her head, but her tone was polite when she corrected the woman. He'll be 12 soon. 12? I didn't know you and Joseph were married long enough to have a son so old. The faint smirk that accompanied her words undermined her show of surprise. First of all, she gave birth to the Savior, Rachel. That, I really, I was in my feelings, guys. Oh, I was in my feelings. Them birds are going at it out there. I'm sorry, I can, like, hear the birds, like, outside my window, and they're, like, going at it like they're arguing <laughs> but um you know she really tried to come for her i was just like oh all right rachel all right i see you but um then we go on more and there's a scene where um basically hannah's with the women I mean, let me move this because it's shaking but um hannah is with the women women and um this kid named alan who was apparently a kid that jesus bought to live with them because jesus is you know the savior and he can do what he want to do so he just randomly saved some random kid <laughs> and now the kid lives with them but um you know alan comes over to where they are and he tells hannah that you know her father is you know selling stories so hannah wants to go over there with her father um and the men so in doing that her brother Jesus, it says that Jesus slid over to make room for her, patting the ground beside him. But she sat next to Abba instead, leaning, um, leaving Alan to fill the vacancy between her and Yeshua. Already at a young age of eight years old, she's already putting that kind of wall between her and the Savior, which I think is crazy. Like, on one hand, I understand, like, you're this eight-year-old, you don't know much about life, um, and you just want the love of your parents. That's it. You want equal attention, equal love. But then on the other hand, this is the savior. Like, I know he's a savior. I know he's going to save the world. So it's just like, it's like on both ends of the spectrum, you're like, I feel bad for her, but you're, 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 you're stopping yourself from the true love of the savior, who is your older brother. Like, I wouldn't even know how I would feel personally in that kind of situation. Like, 
I I don't know. I would probably honestly be like the rest of them, like his his brothers, in which, you know, I, I, I don't even know. It's just like, what would you do if your older brother was Jesus? And you didn't even know him. That, like, when I mean you didn't know him, but you didn't know that he was going to be the savior of the world. All you knew was what your mother told you about the prophecies concerning your brother. But your brother looks like a normal person. How would you, re like, honestly, how would you react to that? I, I couldn't even do it, but anyways, um, then they talk about the prophet Elijah with the whole, um, fire and, and the prophets of Baal and how he basically commanded them to make fire and the prophets of Baal was, um, I think they was praying to Baal to make fire, but Baal didn't make fire, but then Elijah had wet the wood or something like that. I don't, I think it was wood or something that he wet and he had, um, said a prayer out to, to God and God actually burnt up the fire and the water. So, uh, burnt up the fire and the water. He burnt up the wood. I think it was either wood or rocks or something like that. That he burnt up with the water and quenched it up. So, um, quenched it up. You guys, y'all, y'all get what I'm saying, right? <laughs> but they talk about that in here. Um, and then there's this guy named Itamar, and he is the village Hazan. Um, like the caretaker. Basically, he's the caretaker of the scrolls in the synagogue. So he starts talking about how like they have a bunch of enemies. The Israelites have a bunch of enemies. They have the e they have Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and now Rome. So they have six different enemies. Um, but he said, even though many foes seek our defeat, we remain. Always remember, this is a sign of the Lord's favor upon us. So obviously, Hannah is sitting there with these men listening to them. And she's just like, well, maybe it'd be better to be less favored by the Lord and have fewer invaders. And for me, I marked it in blue because that's something that's sad. But at the same time, it's something that is really true. A lot of people want the favor of God without the things that come with it. I was trying to figure out what to say, but um, when you have the favor of God on your life, unfortunately, you will attract enemies. And it's not that God is purposely giving you enemies, but it's for the simple fact that people are not going to be happy about your success. People are not going to be happy about you getting better, getting stronger. They're going to feel threatened. And when they feel threatened, they're going to become a threat to you. Um, so I just thought that was like crazy that she even said it. And I mean, I get she's an eight-year-old girl, but as an adult, as a believer of Christ, as me understanding the faith and everything, just reading that, it's just like, wow. And I, I won't even sit here and say that I haven't thought that because I, I probably have thought that back in the times when I was like deep in my depression and stuff like that. I probably came across that thought once or twice. Like, why? Well, I don't want the favor of God. But you know what? The favor of God is a beautiful thing. Yes, there are... Certain things you don't want to deal with, such as jealousy and people coming after you and people saying things about you. But the favor of God is such a blessing. Like, it's a blessing. Anyways, um, then we have Uncle Cleophus. Cleophus? I think that's how you say his name. Um, and he says that we have much to celebrate enemies or no enemies. Because they, um, they had to, I guess they had a great harvest or something like that. He was talking about that. But um, for me, in my mind, I immediately thought like, I always have something to be happy about. I always have something to celebrate. I don't care how bad my day is. I don't care how angry I get. I don't care how... And yes, Christians get angry, okay? So, yeah. Um, I don't care um, who hurts my feelings. Like, I really always have something to be celebrating. And it doesn't have to be something elaborate. You really need to celebrate the little things. Um, and by that, I can celebrate for the simple fact that my son wakes up in the morning and says, Good morning, Mommy. I can celebrate the fact that I have all of my toes, you know? I can celebrate that I have all of my fingers. I can celebrate that I can go outside my door and feel the cold air because not many people can feel, you know? I can celebrate that I can hold my book steady because there are people who are out there who have shaky hands. So, like, I, I could celebrate this cute little mug right here. Yeah, I'm drinking coffee, cold coffee. Because it's cute. Just because. I can celebrate anything. And whether I have an enemy, whether I have a bad day, whether um, somebody has hurt my feelings, whether something didn't go the way I wanted to, um, I can celebrate that. And I honestly wish I would have remembered that throughout this entire week. Because this week has not gone the way I wanted it to. <laughs> this week has literally been a hot mess. A hot mess. I have been slacking with like my devotionals, my sleeping. Everything has gone wrong, you know. And, um... And planning 
the stuff from my the, the, and the stuff that we're planning for church um you know things not that things have gone wrong but things have been a little slow and um i wish i would have remembered to look at that quote because then i would have been better but yeah um uh okay so after that they're sitting there the men are talking and then all of a sudden they hear hoofbeats and um they're like no one in nazareth owns a horse and that horse has only brought trouble so it could have been the romans it could have been something so they all start you know running and panicking so jesus runs after his uncle and what gets me this is no shade to mary because mary of course i love mary power to the savior's mother but in the fiction okay i'm gonna repeat this this is biblical fiction biblical fiction okay i don't want anybody to watch this video and be offended by how i react to uh mary joseph the brothers of jesus and all that because i mean it's biblical fiction i'm going to react um so yes anyways um so mary <laughs> gives um jude to hannah hannah's eight years old mind you jesus is 12 okay well uh, he's turning 12 so keep that in mind right jesus is the oldest so mary says mind your brother and goes running after jesus okay number one your 12 year old son is with his uncle he's with his uncle you have several other kids under the age of nine okay you leave how old is um jude jude is two years old you leave a two-year-old with an eight-year, an eight and a half-year-old to go run after your twelve-year-old. How does that make sense? I mean, granted, as a mother, you're going to be concerned about all your kids, but you leave your two-year-old. You run with your infant on your hip after your twelve-year-old and have your eight-year-old watch your two. How does that? Please, please make it make sense, people. Make it make sense. Anyways, so, you know, Hannah's just like, mind my brother. Well, who will mind me? She's an eight-year-old girl. Of course she's concerned. That's like, I, I don't even want to think about the worst case scenario, so we're just going to move on. Anyways, um, so then, you know, she watches her mother go after Jesus. She watches her mother protect Jesus and um, hold her baby sister on her head. But then she's like, I long to be inside my mother's embrace too, but couldn't move. That wrecked me because it's just like, Mary, come on, you have other kids. We know Jesus is going to be amazing. We know. We know this, okay? The angels told you and, you know, God's word cannot return void. You know, he's not a liar. It's going to happen. But what about your other kids? Mary, really? Like, that's, that's literally how I felt. Like, I... I was mad, you guys were Mary. Because you have an eight year old, you're telling her to watch your two year old so you can run after Jesus, your twelve year old. And I know somebody might not be might say like it doesn't matter about age, but for me it does. In this type of book. Because like you see danger coming. You leave your eight year old daughter to watch your two year old son to run after your twelve year old son. Obviously, if you hear hoofbeats, these are grown men on horses. Um, back then, they were taking women. You left your eight-year-old to watch a two-year-old. That, that's that's why I was pissed off. Because it's just like, what if she would have been snatched up? What if she would have been shot with her? Like, I don't even, like an arrow or something. Like, come on. I don't think Mary was thinking about that. She probably was like, oh my god, the savior, I gotta save him. You know, and I'm being being funny, you guys. So, again, don't take this to heart. This is biblical fiction, okay? But, yeah, um, I read up to page 23. I'm, like, two pages into chapter 2. Um, and we, we find out that the um, people that came in on horses were not Romans, but they were tax collectors and are looking for Tobias. Um, Tobias? Who is Tobias again? Tobias was... Oh, they don't say. Now I got to look in a book. Tobias. Tobias. Who is Tobias? Oh, Tobias is a potter. Um, So they're looking for Tobias, I guess, because it's something with taxes and all that. And then I stopped reading. So I have to read up to pet chapter 19. Um, That would make me read one third. Um, That is page 146. I'm on page 23, 22 right now. So I have 123 pages to go. So what I'm going to do is read and then
Okay, guys. So, I know I look crazy, but I'm I'm relaxing right now in bed. But um, okay. So I just read chapters two and three, and wow, wow. <laughs> Um, so like I said in chapter 2, you have the tax collector. The tax collector's name is Alvon. Al Alvon, it'll be on the screen. It's A-L-V-O-N. Um, he made grimy. He is grimy. He basically beat up Tobias and broke all of Tobias's um, brand new pots and stuff that he made. So that's grimy. Um, but in the midst of him getting beat up, Jesus decides. Hold on, I'm trying to look for my bookmark. Oh, here it is. Can't get it. Okay, here it is. <laughs> so I don't miss my place. But in the midst of him getting beat up, Jesus decides I'm going to help him and jumps in. But then get kicked. Then he gets kicked by a whore. <laughs> First of all, like I said earlier, when you think of Jesus, you don't think of these type of scenarios. So I love that Melissa is not afraid to really go into depth about what his life could have been like. But homie got excuse me jesus got kicked by <laughs> by the horse which was funny to me um but you know he got hurt and whatnot so now we have hana and him talking and hana's like well what were you thinking why didn't you just stay where you were um and jesus immediately says well when i saw how they treated tobias it wasn't right immediately again you're seeing the savior that he's gonna be like he's compassionate he's caring um, then he goes into telling her about Allah and how their father took him in. And he said that Abba didn't take him in to gain something. He knows it is right to bless others. Then he goes into the scripture, which says, when we give gener when we give generously, the Lord will bless our work and everything we put our hand to. Um, one thing I like about Melissa and what she has done, because a lot of authors do not do this. I've noticed, um, I don't know if you guys are going to see this number right here, this two. She marks all her numbers, I mean, all her scriptures with numbers, and then when you go to the back, I hope you guys are seeing this, there are a total of 46 scriptures that she has used in this book at the end notes, and number two is right here, so that'll be Deuteronomy. Um, so she has all of the scriptures already written for you, which is great. So basically what I do is come back here. Now some of the scriptures in there in this book are not actually written in the end notes, so some of them I do have to find myself. But if they correlate to the back, I will then go and write the scripture next to it. So I'm going to do that later. But, um, yeah, he quotes scripture. And then <laughs> Hannah is just like, well, lately, you know, Jesus has a habit of doling out wise sayings and quoting Torah at the, you know, at any and every opportunity. We know the type of person that Jesus is from scripture. So he definitely quotes scripture like that. But then she's like, who does he think he was? I mean, who did he think he was anyways? A wise king shall... I guess that's supposed to say Solomon, but it says something else. But I'm going to say Wise King Solomon. And I cracked up because, like, yes, you know, King Solomon was wise in all his ways. Um, you know, he, he sought the wisdom of God. But this is Jesus we're talking about. Like, Jesus knows everything. Whatever. Um, then he also quotes some more scripture. And then we have a scene where um, Jesus takes hold of Hannah's hand. And he's like, you don't have to be afraid of anything. She says that his touch comforted her, but she wasn't entirely assured so she easily, like, she quickly just snatched her hand away. And I've noticed that happens a lot, especially, like, when you have new people that come to the church, um, any church, and want to um, become saved. They get nervous. They get afraid of that comforting feeling. So I just thought about that. Um, chapter 3, they go out into the fields because Alan lost a sheep goat. Um, or she goat rather he lost the goat so they all go out and Hannah wants to go with them so she asks her father and her father is like well fine but listen to Jesus I don't need another silly goat roaming the hills by herself I cracked up because I mean your father just called you a goat okay anyways um as they're doing that they get the goat whatever there is a storm that comes and we know back then the weather was tragic like a rainstorm was tragic compared to what it is now but um it says that Jesus vanished and then he emerged out of nowhere back onto the hillside. He found the spot. So then if you go further, she says, well, how did you know that the cave was there? He says, I didn't. And shrugged his shoulders. It's just like, bruh, you're already having this type of communication with God at the age of 12. Um, but then she goes to Alon. She's like, do you think that Jesus could be cursed? She's like, well, haven't you noticed that bad things happened around him first? I mean, first the horse kicked him. Now this? 
So then Alan is just like, well, no, I'd like to say that he's blessed. He's always rescued from real injury. And it's crazy because, like, so far you had the horse situation. He could have been stabbed or killed by one of the men. In instead, he got kicked by a horse, kind of like saying, sit back down and relax kind of thing. And then with the storm coming, he didn't even know there was a cave, but he knew it because God revealed it to him. So that's awesome. Um... Then they get into this argument at home because the kids are ready to eat. <laughs> and, you know, Simon is just like, well, when are we going to eat? Mary's just like, in a while because he hasn't returned back. Jesus is out praying. So then Judah, <laughs> Jude, I'm sorry. Is that Jude? I'm sorry, because it says Judah. Yeah, Jude, sorry. So it says Jude. Um, You know, he's just like, well... No, Simon is complaining because Jude was able to eat already. But Mary is like, well, you know, Jude is two years old. You're five. Don't you want to be treated like a big boy? Little boys have to take naps like the baby. And little boys don't get to go to school you, like you do now. Simon looked uncertain about this reasoning. And it reminded me of my son because my son, oh my God, he's five. Um, and, you know, every now and then he'll start complaining about things. And I'll be like, you're a big boy. If you want to be a little boy, then you got to take a nap. I don't want to take a nap. If you want to be a little boy, you can't have this. I don't want, like, he'll, he'll start complaining. So I thought that was funny because I could relate that back to me as a mom right now with my son. Um, then we go into his mother explaining why Jesus prays. She said that he prayed because he loved the Lord and he wanted to honor him, honor God with his time. And I thought that was profound. Um, because a lot of people don't think about praying as a way of honoring their time with God. They don't honor him with their time in prayer. Um... And I know for me, lately, I have been slacking in my prayer, and I and I felt God calling me to get back into prayer the way I was previously. But, um, you know, most of the time, when you think about praying, you just pray to pray. You don't really think about honoring God with your time in prayer. Um, so that's something that I, I got in my mind. Um, then Hannah, <laughs> Hannah was like, there's something odd about Jesus. For one thing, he never complained, and he always told the truth. That couldn't be normal. And immediately I cracked up on that because it's just like he's not normal because he doesn't lie, because he doesn't complain. And unfortunately, we're born into sin. So complaining and lying becomes second nature to us. Honestly, it's it's a, it's something that we're we've normalized. And um, when we find people who don't complain or who don't lie and who always tell the truth, we think they're odd. But in actuality, we're the odd ones. Um, so then she gets real petty. Hannah gets real petty when her brother, Jesus, comes in the door. Um, he pats his mother on the... I mean, he kisses his mother on the side and his mother smiles. Um, so it says, I rolled my eyes at their display of mutual adoration and banged the bowls on the table. <laughs> she petty. She petty, Betty, all the way. Um, and then there's this whole scene that cracked me up, but I could definitely relate to Hannah in this, where Jesus, his tunic is messed up. He tore his tunic. Um, and you know, Hannah's just like, yes, he's going to get in trouble now. Yes. Um, finally he's going to get, you know, reprimanded for doing something wrong. But what amazes me is that, okay. So first of all, his little brother's upset because Jacob is upset because, um, he would be the next in line to receive that tunic once it was, you know, once Jesus outgrew it, um, they did, they passed clothes back down in the day and people still do that nowadays. But, um, his mother is like, well, if it was too long, I could have just hemmed it for you, you know, getting upset. He's like, I needed the cloth for something as simple as that. And, you know, if your child come at you like, well, I needed to do it for this, you probably ready to back, <laughs> backhand slap your child in the mouth. But what gets me is that in this, in, this, in this paragraph right here, it says, my mother's face displayed a range of emotions, annoyance, puzzlement, and then to my understanding, oh, and then, sorry. My mother's face displayed a range of emotions, annoyance, puzzlement, and then understanding. She simply said, oh, that's it. I blurted out. Aren't you going to punish him? <laughs> Bruh, she is tight right now. She's so mad because, no lie, I've, I've reacted like her before too. When my siblings have done something and I've told my mother about it and you could see on her face she's irritated and wants to yell at the kids, but she doesn't. I I, I snap because it's just like, are you kidding me? Let that be me. I'm getting yelled at, popped, beat, 
but let the kids do it and they good how was that for you so you know her mother's just like mind yourself um so she was getting ready to protest and then she said ema raised her eyebrows you know when your mother or your father do that one eyebrow raise you know you in trouble <laughs> then she's like just like that Yeshua has Yeshua was absolved while I was back under my mother's scrutiny. I stomped across the room. Simon blocked my path, and I stomped on his foot as I stepped around him. She petty. She Hannah is petty, yo. And I can honestly picture this in my mind because we already know that Jesus is about eleven, twelve years old. Hannah's eight and a half. I think Simon is five. So I can only imagine Mary just sitting there looking at her kids, just like. What? <laughs> I can't, y'all. I can't. Anyways, she said that um she had her mother called her out, and you know she slammed the door and walked out. You eight years old girl, bye. That's a beating right there. Anyways, um she said it wasn't fair that I always got scolded, and I I marked that in brown because brown is anything that I can relate to any personal questions that I have, and I can relate to that because me being the oldest, um when I did something wrong back in the day. I was getting yelled at, I was getting beat, I was getting things taken away. Now, we in this new time with this new generation, when my siblings do something, they don't get in as much trouble as if, as I did back in the day. Hopefully that makes sense. So, like, when my mom doesn't get at them for certain things, I'm just like, are you for real? Or, like, say we get into an argument, because I tell you guys right now, me and my siblings in this house are petty. We are petty with one another. Like petty especially my brother who was like the closest in age to me he's 25 and 28 we're three years apart me and him are petty and then me and my baby sister she's 13 i'm 28 what the heck i almost forgot my own age <laughs> so we're 13 years apart right yeah 13 years and then my other brother we're 10 years apart we're not 13 years sorry 14 14 me and my sister are 14 years apart and then my brother, my other brother, were 10 years apart. So, like, when my baby sister and me, we get into arguments because I have a, I have a really bad attitude problem. Um, let me, let me rephrase it. I used to have a really terrible attitude problem as a kid. Um, you know, I grew up and I've gotten better at it. But my sister just entered high school. Um, you know, she just turned 14, teenager. She got a real bad attitude. So, you know, we clash a lot. And because we're so far apart in age... She tries to um, grow up just a little too quick for me. Just a little too quick. Certain things, I just be like, I didn't do that when I was your age. I didn't have that when I was your age. So kind of like irritates me. So we tend to lash at each other back and forth a lot. And, um, you know, I always get in trouble because I'm the oldest. But it's just like, mm, why, why are you not saying nothing to her? Like, why are you not getting her? So I definitely could relate to her saying that it wasn't fair that I always got scolded. Because I deal with that in my house sometimes. Um, you know, it's hard being the oldest sibling but also being the adult and sort of like a co-parent as well to my siblings. So it irritates <laughs> when I say it irritates me, it irritates me so bad, you guys. But, you know, I could relate to that. Anyways, um, then towards the end of the chapter, she gets a gift from Alan. It's a doll. And the crazy thing is, she says that um, I had prayed and asked the Lord for a doll, but I hadn't told anyone. And Alan had given her a doll as a gift. But it was Jesus' idea to give her that. So immediately, again, you're seeing the connection between God and Jesus. You're seeing that communication. You're seeing the sonship. You're seeing the relationship between God and Jesus. And Jesus is only 12 years old. So I just think that's amazing. And then what cracked me up even more is she said, um, it seemed no matter how I felt in resenting him, he always proved himself innocent of wrongdoing. Again, he's Jesus. Jesus is just innocent all around, right? But then she says, sometimes I even resented him all over again for making me feel ashamed about misjudging him. And it's just like, you know, you 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 know, you know meet those people who you don't like. Even though they're innocent, you just, you, you don't like them, right? And then you feel bad that you don't like them, but then you get mad because you feel bad that you don't like them. Because now they're proving to you that <laughs> there's no reason for you not to like them. So then you get upset again with them. <sighs> I must say, 38 pages in, chapter 3, I'm about to start reading chapter 4, and I'm loving it. I am truly enjoying the writing. I'm enjoying Melissa's thought process in creating these characters. Sorry, my phone went off, and I think that was my son's father, probably. I'm not sure. I ain't even check it. Nope. Oh, 
thank you, Jesus. Sorry, you guys. I'm doing some work for church. Um, like I told you, we're planning some stuff for my pastor next week, so. With her um ordination service. Her installation service, sorry. So, somebody just, one of the guests responded back, and it, oh, it's been, it's been a crazy, oh, Jesus. So, I'm going to say church. Even though church is about ministry and God and, you know, Jesus, church is also a business side. And once I joined the administrative team of my church, I've come to really learn the business side of ministry. And it is no joke. Huh. Okay, so I'm going to respond to her in a second because I did tell her I would respond. Thank God, though. I'm going to get back to that. Okay. Anyways, but huh. I'm, I'm loving this so far. Like I said, Melissa has really been like, oh, it's amazing. So, I'm going to get back to reading. I'm going to try to continue reading up to chapter 5. That's two chapters. So, I'm going to try to read two chapters. Hopefully, there's nothing I want to talk about. But, like, it's like every other page I want to talk. So, what I think I'm going to do is I have sticky notes here. I just pulled out, like, a bunch of sticky notes. I have all these sticky notes here. So, I'm probably going to read until chapter 10, most likely, and write my thoughts on a sticky note so that I can discuss it with you guys. And then, yeah. So, I'm going to go back to reading. I'm going to put my music back on. Again, I'm listening to... My ambiance music playlist, and this one is a relaxing music with nature sounds, and it's so amazing. Let me show you guys. Isn't that pretty? Now, in the winter, I do my like winter ones where, oh, excuse me, hold on. What is life? Oh, okay. You know what? I'm going to actually switch it to this Cozy Reading Candles. I kind of like that one. Hopefully there's no ad. Yeah. So it's literally just um, a person sitting there reading. So I'm probably going to go with that one and get back to reading some more. Okay, guys, so quickly, um, remember, remember I mentioned this character, Itamar, um, previously, and how he was talking about how they had the enemies from Egypt, Syria, Assyria, and all that. So, I think Itamar, being the Hazan, who is basically the overseer of the synagogue and the scrolls, I think he knows, like Mary knows, and Joseph knows, that Jesus is the Messiah. Um, because I've noticed that, even, and I, I didn't really think about it back back when they were first talking about it but actually let me find it right now mm -hmm. yeah so as he was talking about how they have all of the, the foes and stuff like that he had stopped right in front of jesus and i didn't think anything of it right but then here again he's teaching of the scrolls and and of the word and again he's looking to jesus and then he says well i'm gonna allow one of our students to try his hand at it first and then jesus says i'll shine with light on it that i can so i think that it's more knows exactly who jesus is as far as being the messiah being the savior of the world and i think he's one of the people that if we would have gone deeper into the background within the Bible, like if we knew the individual people back then, he may have been one of the people to have helped Jesus fully understand scripture. Like we don't know, but like, what if, you know? So I think that's interesting. I'm, I'm literally just picking this up and this happened back in chapter one. So I think that's, that's interesting. So I'm going to mark that. I, I already like marked it up in orange. I'm just going to take a post, a uh, post a tab and um, tab that, but that's interesting. I didn't think about it until now. Okay. Back to reading.
Okay, guys, so I know I said I was going to come back after reading up to chapter 10, but I, I just finished chapter 4. Um, the chapters are not really long, honestly. They're anywhere from like 4 to 8 pages long, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they're not long at all. Um, but the thing is that they're so jam-packed with such amazing goodness. Like, after I discuss this chapter, I'm going to go off camera, get some more reading done, and then come back and discuss my thoughts from chapter 5 to 10. But, oh god. Alright, so, um, lots of scripture being said. Um, one thing I do like is that her father, Hannah's father, Joseph, was talking about um, the scripture that says it is better to obey than to sacrifice. But then he says that it does not absolve one from making the sacrifice. That in and of itself would be an act of disobedience. So it is better to obey than to sacrifice. But you still have to sacrifice because you are told to sacrifice by God. So you obey and you sacrifice. But if you don't sacrifice and just obey, then you're still disobedient. <laughs> it's weird, but I like that. Um, again, I talked about the whole thing with Itamar and how I think that he knows that Jesus is um, the Messiah. Um, and then Hannah goes on to say that the man, Itamar, treats her brother like some great authority, which he is. She says that he has an uncanny ability to recall writings from the law and the prophets. But then what gets me is when she says, why would the Hazan defer to an apprentice? carpenter and that just makes me think like you know our savior is such a humble person as much knowledge as he has as much wisdom as he has as much power and authority as he has he brings himself so low to be with us he would rather suffer for our sins be Beat for our transgressions. And I mean, we all know, if you've seen the Passion of Christ, you know. Um, and I'm not saying the Passion of Christ is like a perfect depiction of how it went about. But I think that is the most realistic depiction I've ever seen of the crucifixion of Jesus, honestly. I'm being honest. Of all the shows and movies I've ever seen about the crucifixion, I feel like the Passion of Christ is the most close biblically speaking um from what i've read from the bible but anyway that's a whole other story anyways um you know like this he's a divine being he's human and he's god he's he's human and divine he's god and man like he's both and he does the most simplest things being a carpenter was not really well known like something you wanted to be back then and he came to earth was born the way we are born born in a shed in a manger in a shed whatever the thing was like when you really sit to think and i'm sorry if you guys hear my brother but you know how these blocks go but like when you really sit to think about these things you really begin to feel the love of god because there's no way i'm sorry me i would not if i had all the power in the world no you're not about to have me laying up in no manger as a baby just saying with the sheeps and the we don't know what kind of animals but come on okay um i don't think i would want to be beat the way he was i don't think i could do it you know so that just it blows my mind um but then <laughs> they talk about the whole story about gideon and how the warriors had to, the, to lap up the water and how they lapped it up like dogs um so they're like yeah but you know uh, tell me what you learned from the whole story with Gideon and the Midianites. <laughs> and um, Jacob, I think he talks about how it's wrong to worship Baal, which is true. But then Simon's funny behind. He's five years old, mind you. This literally, literally, Simon reminds me of my son. My son is five. He's like, he's he crouches on all fours like a dog. And he said, it's fine to drink water like a dog. Then he starts making the slurping sounds as he lapped up water from an imaginary stream like Gideon's warriors. And then his brother um, pushes him. So he starts croning and barking on the floor like a dog. So everybody starts laughing. So I thought that was funny. Um, so then she answers her father's question. And she's like, I had the best answer for Abba. She says her answer. But then Jesus tilts his head and studies her. And he says, it's true that there comes a time for judgment. But when Israel cried out to the Lord for help, Adonai was merciful and compassionate. He appointed Gideon to save them out of the enemy's hands. Then he quotes the scripture that um, God is slow to anger and rich in grace. Um, and then, of course, Joseph 
is excited about the answer. So he, you know, gives a little love to Jesus. And he says, you speak the truth. We can all be thankful for God's mercy. Then it says that Hannah gets upset. She, her, her heat, um, her cheeks surge up with heat. And then she says, my annoyance built into a seething jealousy. So just in this, you really can see the, the pain and the hurt that Hannah's feeling. Um, and then she even goes further to have a discussion with her father about, you know, how will people ever notice me if I'm always standing in Jesus' shadow? So then her father says, which I think is so perfect. Okay, guys, so sorry about that. Um, I switched cameras. I'm using my cell phone instead of the camera that I was using previously because I need to import the footage onto my computer because I have no space on my phone um, on the camera right now. But um, as I was saying, yeah, her father gave her like an amazing response back and I marked it up in green if you guys can see. And um, I'm going to read it. It says, um, so this is Joseph speaking to Hannah after she says, um, how will people ever notice me if I'm always standing in the um, in Jesus' shadow? So her father says, sometimes it takes time to understand what the Lord has planned and purpose for each of our lives. That's part of the beauty and mystery of Adonai, that his ways and thoughts are higher than ours, which is a scripture, which I need to actually write that out. But then she says, um, our privilege, then he says is, our privilege is to spend a lifetime striving after his deeper truths. He then says, when the Lord made your brother, he chose me to raise him and he chose you to be his sister. I choose to think that the light poured on him makes those of us around him shine brighter too. And I think that's important because a lot of the times when we um, feel like we're in the shadow of people, we begin to grow resentment. We begin begin to become jealous. We begin to get angry. And I used to feel that way concerning my brothers. Um, both my brothers, as you guys know, are musicians. And um, my entire family were all musically inclined. My dad um, was a... Sorry if you guys hear my brother. He is super loud. But my dad was a music producer. So he's worked with Monto Jordan. He's worked in that industry for a while. Um, back when, you know, they were made, they made real music and stuff like that. So my dad is well known for that. He plays, um, he, he has a lot of mixtapes and stuff out. So like when I hear certain songs on the radio, I start jamming and be like, oh yeah, my dad produced that song. But, um, you know, my family were just musically inclined. Um, my mom, when she was growing up, she was into singing and dancing. So a lot of our parents, um, skills and talents were passed down to my siblings and I, my sister can sing. I used to sing, I don't sing no more like that, but I'm, I'm the dancer, you know, um, artistically speaking, I took art, but my art, the way I portray my art is through writing and through doing makeup artistry. Both my brothers are musicians. My sister plays the, uh, violin and some other instrument. Um, I took piano in, cl in school and I did guitar, but I'm more so of the artistic type of person. I like the drawing and I like, um, doing the makeup artistry and the writing portions and dancing. So, you know, but I always had this kind of resentment toward my brother um, because he was living the life, if you will. Um, he was going on tour. He was doing everything musically and he was allowed to do the music thing. I wanted to pursue dance, but I'll never forget the time that my father told me that dance was not a real, um, a real job. And um, I just I didn't pursue it, you know, because they didn't approve of that. So I went after something else. But, um, you know, I, I actually presented my brothers and felt like I was in their shadow. And um, my bishop definitely has been, not just my bishop, but other people as well. But mainly, I speak about my bishop because I love my bishop. That's dad number two. That's that's my dad right there. Um, I love my bishop. But, um, you know, he's been speaking to me. But it's I know it's coming from a word from God concerning me not being in the shadows of my brother. Um, I have the same sort of... How did he describe it? Um, the same sort of blessing, just not in the musical sense. My brothers are both gifted. My brother, my 25-year-old brother has played for Melanie Fiona. He has played for Tanache. He has been on tour with Mario. He did music for BT B2K. He produced one of Mario's shows. Um, he's been working with 50 Cent. Like, my brother has worked with uh, numerous people. My brother plays drums, um, and he's now getting into, like, music, music being an MD for, um shows and stuff like that and then my other brother who's 18 he's getting ready to go on tour i think he was supposed to go play with jacaylin carr um this week or last week he was supposed to basically start playing with a gospel artist and um that didn't go through but he has some stuff coming up in december where he'll be, he'll be traveling on tour and stuff like that so it's just like i used to feel 
resentment toward them. I felt like I was in their shadow because it was all about them. And, um, you know, over time I've come to realize this, I'm not forgotten, but I, I, I can definitely relate to Hannah. The only difference is I'm the oldest and she's the second oldest, but I'm the oldest. So, you know, for me, it was a little bit more of a struggle because I felt as the oldest, I should have gotten at least some type of attention. Um, and I'm just being blunt and vulnerable with you guys because this book is really hitting home for me. It's really hitting hard. Um, but I am loving this book. Like I said, Miss Melissa is phenomenal, like phenomenal. And it's taking me a little bit longer to read the chapters just because I'm like really like diving into this. I mean, you can see this tab so far. So again, I'm going to read up to chapter 10. Um, I'm probably just going to read all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way. I'm probably just going to read all the way through to chapter 19 and then come back after I read chapter 19 with my thoughts. I have my post-it notes, so I'm going to write my notes down on post-it notes. And um, that'll be it. So, yeah, I'm going to go import this footage onto my computer so I can record back on that camera because I don't like the camera on my phone. The back-facing camera is fine, but the front-facing camera on my phone, I just, I don't like. Mm -mm. So, yeah, I'm going to go. Okay, ladies, so as you can see, I'm in a different location. <laughs> Um, I ended up coming to my son's father house because I have to work tomorrow and my mom was going to drop me off to work, but some stuff came up and she has to take my brother to work as well. So yeah, I had to come over here because where I have to go is literally not too far from his house. Um, I'm going to see if the client can just come to his house, but if not, I'll travel from here to where she is and it'll be easier that way. But I did bring my book. I'm trying not to show you guys too much, but um, I got it with me. I haven't read since then, honestly. I'm not even gonna lie. I have not read anything since I last spoke to you guys. So I'm still at chapter 5. You see that? Chapter 5. But the goal is to at least get to chapter 15. Ooh, that lighting just changed. Whoops. Nope. Not gonna change. Whatever light just changed. But the goal is to get to um, at least chapter 15 and try to come back and talk to you guys about it. If I can't, then I'll do that tomorrow. But yeah, I'm going to get this going because I have to complete this book at least by Monday night, um, by Sunday night, because I'm going to be starting another book with my sis, Stephanie, and check out her channel just because the honest screen for that. But um, we're going to be starting a book together, and I'm super excited because this is a, a book that I was actually sent for review that I also have to do a reading blog for. So the goal is to try to finish and get to page chapter 20 tonight on this and then try to finish tomorrow. Fingers crossed this book is 400 plus pages. About 420 something odd pages i'm gonna just say 440 um so yeah big book but i'm excited to read some more so i'm gonna read some more um and edit videos and i'll come back Hey guys so it is sunday the 15th of september um i know this is like a weird reading vlog because it's not going the way i planned since i had to go to my son's father house on friday but um yes yeah, so i made it to page 164 and this beautiful book and i'm loving this story you guys i just love the way melissa has really crafted hannah and making her I don't want to say making her out to be a bad sister, but making her out to be one of those people who don't immediately fall at the feet of Jesus, you know. I'm loving that. I'm loving the family dynamics, seeing how they um, interact with Jesus. I love seeing Jesus speak the scriptures from the Old Testament. Um, sorry, my son is in the car. I'm in the car with my sister and my son. My sister is right there. My son is right there. But um, we're in the car. My mom is in the service with my brother. We're going to be leaving soon. It's 119, so we'll be leaving to go get something to eat and then go to my church. But um, I'm loving it. Lots of blue tabs, so I will say. Hmm. Lots of blue tabs. Go sit down. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Um, lots of blue tabs. Um, it's very, very heartbreaking to read. It really makes me emotional. It really aggravates me with Hannah. Um, I'm going to have a whole like full-blown review because this book is just so good. But um, I highly recommend you guys check it out. It's biblical fiction, and it takes place from the perspective of one of Jesus' sisters. And um, 
it's it's mind blowing. Right now, Hannah's in a situation. Well, she put herself in a situation because of one of her aunts. Her aunts and her relatives are Sadduce Sadducees. So, um, her aunt is like trying to get her married off to some wealthy guy, um, and they set up a whole scheme. Um, it's kind of like the situation with Naomi and, and Rahab, Rahab <laughs> with Naomi and Ruth, but um, Naomi and Ruth did theirs with wisdom, whereas her aunt Lilith and um, Hannah did it in a more um, scheming type of way so that kind of caused some friction between her and Elan and I love Elon Elon is the kid that was brought in to live with them as like a um, he's kind of like a brother but he's more of a friend and Elon you could tell from the time that they were young he always had feelings for her but she didn't really look at him like that she looked at him more like a brother and um, some stuff transpired with that which kind of gutted my heart out so I am loving it my son is making silly faces of course and um, yeah I'm loving it so I'm at part three right now which is interesting this book is really really good don't sit down what? yes they don't need to see your pimple he has a pimple on his chin okay bye sit down but um it's really really good i'm really enjoying it and i definitely can't wait to finish up and find out what's going to take place right now at the end of part two she has officially been betrothed to um omar omar whatever his name is um and alan has left and um she's getting ready to leave i don't know where she's going to i can't remember I'm sorry, my son is making crazy faces. But, um, yeah, I'm going to end the vlog here for now. Come back to you guys. Hopefully, I can read some more while I'm in the car. But if I don't, I'm hopefully going to finish this Monday. So, we have a lot left to go. But I'm going to try to tackle about 100 more pages. Let's see. That's page 300. I'm on one. So, I got 150 more pages just about <coughs> to go. Also, I'm sick. Yes, you're sick. But um, 150 pages left to go before I get to the next, through the next um, second third of this book. So, great read so far.
guys so it is monday september 16th and this will be the last and final day of this reading vlog so i'm so sad because i literally have like 25 chapters left to go and um i'm on the last one third of this book and it's crushing me because it's almost done and i'm truly truly enjoying this Melissa, at this point, she reminds me of a combination of Tessa Afshar as well as Connie Lynn Cassette. Because we know that Tessa takes um, actual accounts from the story and creates fiction around it. Whereas Connie takes fictional characters and use those fictional characters to include biblical people and events in her story. And I feel like for me, Melissa is a combination of both concerning this book, simply because she's taking actual accounts and actually integrating Jesus into this book along with his brothers and Mary and Joseph, but she's also given a fictional character, whereas Hannah, we don't know his two sisters' names, but she has given this person a name and a being and a personality, and it's just, it's amazing just to see Jesus' interactions with his siblings because we don't really fully 100% know how he interacted with his siblings as a young boy and as a teenager. We only know what happened when he was about 30, 33, and um, that's pretty much all we know. We don't know anything else, and it's just like, to see it all come together in this book, though it's fictional, it's like, oh, I'm not ready for it to be over, and Hannah is pissing me off. Like, I love Hannah, and I'm going to say this in my review. I absolutely love Hannah. But I hate the simple fact that she's so close-minded and everything has to be about her. But I also get her at the same time because I used to be like that with my siblings. So it's kind of like a hard situation to be in. But um, yeah, we're going to finish this book. You guys are going to watch me finish this book on camera. And it's going to like break my heart. Be ugh, it's going to break my heart to finish it. I want the second book immediately. But um, yeah, I am a little sick. So I sound a little nasally, you know, when you when you have kids and your children get sick, then they like to be all up on mommy and then mommy ends up getting sick. So um, I literally only have two hauls left. So I need to go grab me some hauls, some tissue boxes, some Lysol wipes, Lysol spray. I have a little bit of coffee here. Um, it is currently 1.16 p.m. I want to try to read this before my son gets out of school. He gets out at like 2.55ish. So we're going to try to read this book within an hour and a half, finish it up prayerfully. So you're going to watch me do that. Um, you guys saw on Sunday, I was in the car reading because we go to two services on Sunday. We go to a morning service that my brother plays drums at. And then we go to our service at 4 p.m. So we went to the other service, but I didn't go in the car. I mean, I didn't go into the service just because I was extremely tired. Um, you guys know, if you follow me in the Facebook group, I posted up an update video. I've just been really tired and worn out. Last week was horrible. But um, thankfully, this week has started off pretty well. I was able to do my devotionals. Not at the time that I wanted to, only because I'm not feeling well. But I did make sure that I prioritized doing my Bible study that I'm doing with um, Erica Wiggenhorn, which is on the Book of Luke. And then I also prioritize my devotional time. Now, my devotional time was a little cut short because it wasn't as long as I normally do it. But um, I still got that time with God in. So I, my day definitely was a little bit smoother. I cleaned the bathroom. I cleaned the kitchen. Plus, um, I tidied up my room a bit. That's a plus. So I still have some things to put up. And I know, I know, I know I have to get these giveaway prizes out. I have not picked the giveaway winner yet. I haven't forgotten about that. I've just been bogged down with so much stuff going on. The giveaway prizes are here. I'm going to have to repackage that. I actually have to order some new um, shipping envelopes from um, U U USPS. So I need to do that. But I will announce that giveaway winner next week. Um, that winner will be announced. I didn't send out my newsletter like I wanted to today, the Monday morning coffee. But I think this week I'm not going to send them out. I'm going to start sending them out next week or in October just to start first so that I can compile a few ideas and things like that to get that going and um, whatnot. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go onto my ambiance playlist on YouTube on my TV. And right now I'm putting on, it's called Enchanted Tea Party. And let me show you guys real quick on my phone. And I apologize if you guys hear my brother. He's playing music. You guys know how that goes. I don't need to explain that. Y'all know how my brother is. Um, say that. Because, you know, we love some Transformation Church. Yes, we do. Um, I'm watching the Crazy Faith series, which is so good. But um, Ambiance Playlist, Where Art Thou? And I am playing this one at the moment. Let's get the add out the way first so I'm playing this one on my TV at the moment 
it looks literally like that it's just a book with tea teapots and stuff like that with candles going and it's called enchanted tea party asmr ambiance so that's what i'm gonna play on the tv i'm gonna blast it so i don't hear my brother's music but um yeah so i'm gonna fix the camera so you guys can watch me read and cry <sighs> hopefully not cry but i'm loving it and right now we're at the situation where hannah's husband is hissing me off i didn't like him from the start i hated how aunt lilith which is hannah's aunt did things to get her married off and now hannah's like in this loveless marriage and it's like killing me because she can easily just be like jesus help me you know you know yeshua brother like come on big bro like help you know and it's like he's trying yeshua is trying so hard to get her to come to him willingly but she's like holding off because she has this kind of hurt and resentment from when they were younger and how he had all the attention so yeah at this point we're at the point where jesus came and um this actually i read this today in luke chapter four um, from a Bible study where he came and he went to the synagogue and he read the scripture Isaiah 61 um, and then he said um, that the scripture is fulfilled and this is now when the people in his town of Nazareth are basically disliking him they hate him they try to throw him off the cliff and everything like that so that's what's going on in this scene um, and then now Mary and, her, and his brothers are now looking for him because Jesus has gone off obviously we know he left so that he wouldn't be harmed so he has gone off. She went to run to find Alan, and Alan told her off. Yes, he did. And it was like, yes, I was happy for that because she deserved it. And he still loves her, which is like, oh, it guts me. So I have high hopes that they'll be together at the end. I'm not sure if she's going to give me that happy ending. Melissa hopefully will. But, um, so yeah, right now we have them in o Omer, Omer, or whatever Hannah's husband name is. He's a Sadducee. He's a part of the Sadducee's family. So, um, he's now finding out all this stuff about, you know, Mary and them believing that Yeshua is the Messiah and he feels some type of way. Um, and there was some stuff revealed about his family that kind of like pissed me off. Like, <gasps> man, man. So, yes, we're gonna fix this camera, bring it down, and, um, get to reading.
Okay, guys, so I made it to uh, part four, sorry. And I'm sneezing a lot, so I'm sorry if I look like my eyes are watery, but part four. Eight chapters left to go, and basically in the last few chapters that I read, we basically see um, everything piling up to the point where Jesus gets crucified. So, um, at this point, we see that Hannah's in-laws are basically plotting against Yeshua, and that Herod wants to see Yeshua. So they basically tell Hannah to go back to Nazareth, find out her brother's whereabouts, and to let them know. Or she is basically to warn him and tell him to go to Herod's palace. Let me just plug this in real quick because it's getting ready to die. But you have that. Then um, she tells her mother and her brothers about it. They go to I don't even I don't know where they went. It's in scripture that where they went, but um. They went to speak to him, and this is at the point where I think in Mark chapter 6, when they're when, um, people are telling him that his mother and brothers are outside, and his sisters, and he's like, well, um, I think who, whoever obeys or follows my father is my mother, my brother, and my sister. That scripture, I can't remember the, name, the, the actual scripture, but um, I marked it up in here. I just don't have, here it is. Um... Really trying to find it. Yeah. So it says, whoever does what my father in heaven wants, that person is my brother and sister and mother. And then, you know, Hannah and the, and the boys get upset. Um, Mary gets a little hurt, but she understands the purpose that is on his life. Um, then you have Alan. He has become now a follower of Christ. So he's basically retelling Jesus, healing a lot of the people from the Bible, such as the man that was brought through the roof. He was paralyzed, and his friends put him through the roof to be healed. Um, the women, the leapers, and all of that. So, uh, yeah, that's basically all that's going on in this. Um, then <laughs> Hannah ends up going home, and she finds out that, I think her name is Tabitha, who was one of her sister-in-laws, um, ends up telling Razalia, which is her husband's mother, about her brother and how her mother... Um, was impregnated by the Holy Spirit, and, you know, Raz never did care for Hannah, she always looked at Hannah as, like, a country girl, and because she's a Sadducee, she's had this type of mindset of being better than everyone else, so, um, she, she came for Hannah, and my heart was broke. I felt bad because, um, Tabitha wasn't telling on Hannah's brother to get Hannah in trouble, she was really trying to get Raz to understand that he was the messiah but raz is an evil twisted woman so yeah she i guess she tells omer and omer now has an attitude problem and basically it looked like that he getting ready to divorce her like that's what it looked like but um what i do want to speak about is this part where um right okay so she meets yeshua and they're telling him not to go to jerusalem to, to lay low or whatever so he's like you know he's not gonna go they were supposed to go i think for the feast he said he wasn't gonna go um, Hannah then tells him about the plot against him to basically, in essence, kill him. And then when he's just alone with her, he's like, you know what, I am going to go, which is crazy. Um, so now we know he's walking into his death, but one thing he tells her before he leaves is, um, to trust in me. So then then it's this paragraph that says, um, Yeshua had told me before to trust him when I was a young woman. The first time he said it, I chose not to and ended up where I was now but this time I would I would trust him I didn't know how he would do it but if Yeshua could really do the impossible why couldn't he defeat our oppressors and for me I think it's important that when God or Jesus tells us to trust them we should a lot of the times we choose not to trust um and then we put ourselves in worse predicaments and worse circumstances especially when it comes to like finances and romance and um you know f family relationships we're supposed to trust God to fix that. We're supposed to trust God to provide for us. We're supposed to trust that, you know, Jesus is going to help and save us. But when we decide to take things on our own hands, we're, one, not trusting them, and we're putting trust in ourselves. And when we put trust in ourselves, we're really damaging ourselves even more. I know that was the case for me back when I was in um, college and high school. I was told to trust God, and I didn't trust God in certain situations, and my life just got worse um, because I chose to trust myself and in trusting myself, I made bad decisions, wrong judgments, and um, I did things that weren't conducive to um, my spirit, but things that pleased my flesh instead. So I think that was awesome. But yeah, we're at the part now, part four, Jerusalem, um, and 
I guess this is it, you know, when he gets crucified and things like that. Yep, this talks about the whole crucifixion and him being resurrected and stuff like that. So, eight chapters left to go. I'm going to read this. It is 226 right now. I'm going to probably read a little bit more to 255 and then run across the street to get my son. So, hopefully I can read it before then, but um, let's get back to reading. So it's 3.13. I went and picked up my son. I finished a book before I left. I went to pick him up. I came back home. I tabbed up the entire book. I finished tabbing it up. My thoughts? Um, definitely five stars. I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. Um, I didn't know how it would come, would come across as biblical fiction having the perspective of Jesus' sister. But, you guys, I'm sold. Um, Melissa Rosenberger, um, book two for The Unveiled, I need now. Like, I need it right now, ASAP. It was so good. I truly enjoyed this a lot. The way that she crafted the, not just the world, because there was a lot of traveling back and forth between different cities and stuff, which I enjoyed. I love the use of scripture. Some of the scriptures she did pinpoint exactly where it came from. Other parts of scripture you would have to find in your Bible yourself, which I enjoyed. She did include 40, 41, excuse me, 44 scriptures. She included 44 different scriptures in this. And in her end notes, she does give you all 44, but there are also other scriptures that scriptures that are not at the, in the end notes that you can locate yourself. But um, overall, I truly, 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 truly enjoyed reading this book. This book was so good, so amazing. The writing was flawless. I loved each and every character. Let me bring this down just a little bit. So I'll you guys hear my brother again, I'm trying to speak as loud as possible, even though I sound nasally. But I enjoyed every single character. I really, really loved Hannah's character. She reminds me a little bit of myself as a sibling, um, more so me being an older sibling. She is the second oldest, but I am the oldest, so I kind of get how she feels um, when it comes to like her getting reprimanded and her other siblings not getting as reprimanded. Um, I definitely understood that and her wanting her mother's attention. I'd, I'd, I've never felt like I needed my parents' attention because I feel like my parents gave us equal attention. So that's just, you know, I'm grateful for that. But um, I totally enjoyed her character. She was a bit aggravating and annoying, but to see her growth um, into the faith throughout her years from 8 to, I think, 30 and a half years old, 
was amazing. Um, I hate her husband. I hate it. Well, ex-husband. Put it like that. I hate her ex-husband. Um, that ending gave me so much life. So much life. I am hoping that the sequel is a continuation of her story. Um, because I need more of Hannah. I want to see what happens between her and Alan. I want to see if they develop a romance. Because it, you can tell that the love is there between the two of them. Um, and I definitely want to see that kind of, like, grow a little bit, you know? Just a little bit. Um... There were some things that I enjoyed that Alon had said. But um, the last thing he said... Was it Alon? Mm, yeah, it was Alon. He said, I don't understand it all, but I know Yeshua is not like other men. He will never reject you. He loves you. And um, he was basically trying to... Basically, he was telling... Um, I think it was James... Yes, he was telling James and um, Hannah that, you know, Jesus resurrected. And how all the women... Mary, I think it was Mary Magdalene who found him. Um, was speaking to him, basically, from the tomb in like his spirit form. Um, you guys get what I'm saying. Oh my god, I gotta say this again. I hate being sick, but, oh my god, okay, but, um, yeah, he was telling them, and, you know, this is now, Hannah's like, okay, you know what, now I fully believe my brother, but now he's like, are you gonna go with us to see him, but she's like, I don't wanna go, I don't wanna be rejected again, and she's starting to feel bad about how she treated him all this time, even though, knowing that her mother told them that he was the prophesied messiah, and that's when Alan told her that, you know, Jesus is not like everyone else, that he loves, um, and will always love her and things like that. And, uh, it just ended on a cute note with, um, her and Alan, and I just need part two. So, overall, I enjoyed <laughs> this book a lot more than I thought I would. Um, yes, I recommend this. Highly recommended. If you love Tessa Afshar and how she takes biblical accounts and creates fiction around it, and then if you like Connie Lynn Cassette and how she takes biblical people but she throws them around fictional characters melissa M yeah get in the shadow of the king um yes i love it so much it was amazing and I, that's all i'm gonna say i'm gonna do a full bone review on this book um soon it's probably gonna be featured in one of the upcoming reviews really soon because this book is so amazing i highly recommend it links to get this book are down below amazon um, Kenzo, and I'm gonna try to find it on ChristianBook.com and maybe even Barnes and Nobles if I can. But I highly recommend this book. It is so good, so 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 good, so good. But I'm gonna end this video here. I hope you guys enjoyed this reading vlog. I tried not to be as spoilery as I normally am. You know, I tried to include more clips of me actually reading rather than me talking. But yes, if you guys enjoyed this video, thumbs it up. Comment down below. If you aren't subscribed, subscribe to my channel. And if you are subscribed, just click the bell to stay notified. And I will see you guys in the next reading vlog. Bye.